Happy Friday, June 26th to all my friends out there on Facebook. Uh, we're going to go live. It's the, let's see, I've got three minutes before one o'clock, just letting everybody jump on here. So if you're with me early, do me a favor, check in, say hello, make a comment. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover today. And I'm going to say it a few times today. We have, oh, that's right, a presidential election coming up. We've got a lot of consumers that are waiting because the hallucination is we're going to go back to 2007, 8, 9. So we're going to talk about our price is going to drop and what are we going to do? And is the whole world going to become foreclosures again, right? We all know that conversation. What's up, Ed? I see you jumping in there. I see Ryan's in the house. I see Nicole. I see Jen Tackney down the street. Good to see you. Nancy Hughes. I see, looks like Mark from New York City. Good to have you, my friend. Or New City, excuse me, New City, New York. So for my friends that are just jumping on, check in, say hello. Um, I'm really excited about today's show. I know I have a tendency to say this every week that this could be the most important show. But as we as we get started, before I bring in uh, you know David and our guest expert coach Yvonne, um, I want to reiterate something that I said to all of our business coaches this morning. That around the middle of March, we made a statement as a company to everyone inside our organization, all of our full time employees, our coaches, our clients, our friends, our community members everybody in our world, we said three things. Number one, we got to focus on safety, right? Safety for you, for your family, but also for your clients and also for your money and for your business. Being safe was the number one priority starting back middle of March. The second thing I said, everybody was, you got to keep the business moving forward, which meant take care of your existing clients under contract. Be the one that reaches out. If you can remember, now, what, what feels like a long time ago, when I said to you the first week in April, you might want to call your loan officer on all of your escrows and say, is this loan really going to be approved? Is this loan really going to close? And many of you know how helpful that was because we were so caught up in COVID and what was going on in the world that many of us lost sight of taking care of the day-to-day -day operations of our business. So I was driving that one home for you and with all of our coaches and with all of our clients and myself and our own business. And the third thing I said was, you've got to load the cannon, which sort of metaphorically I was saying that May and June will become the new spring market. And of course, when we started doing This Week in Housing, right, with our friends at KCM, both David and Steve said the same thing. You can plan on emphatically May and June really beginning the beginning of the spring market You've experienced it, I've seen it, everywhere throughout the US, we're seeing it, right? Even some of the toughest marketplaces, you know, New York City, Manhattan, even in uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, we're seeing now things are opening up and starting to move. But when you look at the middle states and the mid to low price points, you and I both know we're all seeing the same thing. Not enough inventory, multiple offers, take a listing, it sells quickly, and let's face it, with all that stuff happening, this show becomes even more important. So before I bring him in, it's now one o'clock and I know a lot of you are jumping in there. I wanna remind you, today we're gonna to talk about a couple of things. We're gonna talk about the concerns that people have about prices dropping. And we're gonna help you understand and be the knowledge. We're gonna be able to educate people on what's really going on with supply and demand, right? And what's happening with people's homes values as it relates to is the whole world something gonna become REOville, bank owned properties again, foreclosures like we experienced in 789. So we're gonna talk about pricing. We're also gonna talk about the jobs market. We're gonna talk about the overall economy and how that's impacting us. And yes, we're also gonna talk about the election and the impact that that's gonna have on all of us. So to get started, let's, let's do it. So by the way, for everybody out there watching right now, do me a favor, would you, would you tag two of your friends that need to see this show? Right? We've been doing this you know, every week for about nine weeks, and then we went to every other week. It would mean the world to me if you tagged right now in the comments two people that you know in the business, right? that if they saw this in their newsfeed, they would be like, oh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm super busy, or I'm not as busy as I want to be, and I need Anita. I see you from Naples, right? or Ginger coming in from Prescott, Arizona. I need this kind of information, these types of slides. 
so I can move my business forward and help more clients. So do that for me if you would. And let's bring in our, uh, our guests. So uh, Yvonne and David, welcome. Happy Friday, by the way, Yvonne. Uh, happy Friday, 26, my lovely wife, Kathy Ferry's birthday today. So yeah. uh, big shout out to, to my wife out there. So uh, Yvonne, the vast majority of people maybe haven't gotten exposed to you. Um, you know, you and David have connected. You know how I feel about you. Would you take maybe 30, 40 seconds and give people context for who is Yvonne Arnold? Where do you work? And, you know, sort of your history in the real estate business. Well, I'll start with um, Bill Pipes did a real success with me several years ago. And when we got to chatting, I said I started answering phones for my brother's real estate office when I was 14. And I would take the uh, price, press enterprise and the newspapers and cut the ads out, put them on it, tape them on a book. And then I take the calls. And then when they call in, I'd say, where are you calling from? What are you what, what are you calling from? And they said this. I do tick marks and then transfer it over to the agent. He goes, you were the original ISA. <laughs> so. So basically, I've been around a long time. Uh, escrow title experience, um, licensed since 1989 in Southern California, also now licensed in Idaho. And, um, and so 30 plus years in the industry, two major crashes, uh, pandemic, several small crashes, and just continually um, thrived and uh, have been with you as a coach for 11 years and now a mastery coach. And I get to coach a lot of your top clients. And uh, boy, this has been a really fun year to do that. Uh, the grit that we are seeing and the expertise uh, is really showing through. Big time, big time. Well, thank you for joining us today. So David, at this point, you need no introduction, my friend. You are the man from Keeping Current Matters. Um, David, I wanna just jump right into pricing, right? Because sure. this is, you know, when I, I mentioned to you a couple of days ago that Yvonne, you probably saw it on one of our all coaches pages where I said, or all client pages. What are the objections, concerns, and conditions? What are the fears you're hearing right now from clients? And it was just overwhelming, the response. I am concerned about home prices, not the agents necessarily, but their buyers and sellers. Concern about home prices going down. If I buy this home, is it gonna be worth dramatically less? If I sell and buy the next one, is it gonna be worth dramatically less? Maybe I should just wait. So, so I know, David, you're gonna hit that hard with slides. So we're gonna take it away, you go, and then Yvonne and I are gonna jump in and contribute as much as we can, because this stuff is really powerful. Yeah, it is, and, and I appreciate you, um, you setting it up that way and that, and that question that you asked coaches, because you know it's interesting. I was on a panel a couple of uh, days ago, and here's the question that was asked. What do you say to somebody right now that says, you know what, I think I'm gonna wait? Yeah. You know, kind of that I have concerns and certainly we want to, if it's best for them to wait, we want to help them do that. You know, Tom, we started this out saying, let's give people the truth and let's trust their intelligence. But if they are making a decision to wait because they've been misinformed and Yvonne, you talked about this of being the educator, we've got to go out there and do that right now. So let's talk about that from that perspective. And I'll kind of set it up this way. There are, there, there are a lot of places in the market relative to pricing right now, and I've pulled some of them out where I would say simply this, experts are not agreeing. And some of that's going to cause headlines coming up. And, and I pulled a quote um, uh, from, from Moody's here that I'll share with you. And, and it's from Mark Zanny, the chief economist at Moody's. And here's what he says. The confluence of high unemployment and the end of forbearance measures means that we'll get more defaults and ultimately more foreclosures, more foreclosure sales, and that'll put weakness into the housing market. So, so I want to take that quote and say, okay, things, you know, Mark's quote here is those get out and, and get out into headlines. We need to be prepared to help people understand that. And you mentioned it right, Tom. Let's talk about supply and, and then let's, let's get in demand. So I'll talk about supply first, maybe pause and let, you know, pull you and Yvonne in here to, to talk about that in the market and what we need to do. But some really interesting information came out this week. And, and I want to tie it back to Mark's quote of high unemployment. Now, next Friday, we're going to get the second look or not, not the second look, the gosh, the third look now uh, at the, un the monthly unemployment report for the June report. And we'll have more information the next time we meet in two weeks. But Black Knight came out with some interesting information on forbearance. And I want to share that real quick. It says of all active forbearances, which are past due on their mortgage payment, 
77% have at least 20% equity on their home. We've been talking about this for weeks, this idea of the equity that people have in their homes across this country. If you play this graph out and you go to the next uh, percentage over from those green bars at 13%, you know this, at least 90% have at least 10% equity on their homes. Why is this so important right now? And they sum it up in the report and it's because of this. The high level of equity provides options for homeowners, policymakers, mortgage investors, servicers to help avoid downstream foreclosure activity and default related losses. So interesting about, about these people in forbearance right now and the amount of equity. We talked about the John Burns Consulting you know, report that showed us the amount of equity. 42.1% of the homes are owned free and clear in this country. And you remember that you have access to those slides. And we're seeing that equity reflective in the forbearance numbers as well. Because what can happen right now is 90% of those people, even more, could pay a commission before they were underwater, yep. okay? So as we look at forbearance and we say, okay, all these people are in forbearance, we see a, a flood of potential foreclosures there. Well, I would, I would make the, the case that, that, that with the level of equity, I, I don't see that being likely. Um, I, I think we can look at that level of equity and say it's much different. We, you know, we told you back in 2008 what the banks learned, what the federal government learned, they don't want to repeat again. So as we look at supply relative to forbearance and, and unemployment, we go, okay, that's, that's not likely to, uh, to occur based on that. The other piece in the supply conversation here that we have Hold to, on though, David. Hold yeah, on. Yeah, go ahead. Hold on, go back to the, uh, the, the bar graph slide, please. Yep. Yvonne, when you see this, right? You and I remember, you know, not what doesn't feel that long ago in 2007 and eight, I was calling on banks and saying, I've got the best agents. I'm gonna help everybody get REO accounts. And I was putting, you know, hundreds of people on, you know, back then conference calls and saying, let me introduce you to my friend, Ron Burgum. He runs IndyMac. He needs agents. And, you know, I see both of you smile because you, you, know, you remember these days and you yeah. know that guy. Yeah. Yvonne, when you see this, what do you see? Uh, real life experience um, from so many of our clients and, you know, all of us that are still in the industry. Um, I'm going to go right, right along with that. I don't see that increase of foreclosures like um, Mark would suggest. Only because, yes, we see unemployment, but real case scenario right now, unemployed owner right now, $200,000 in equity, but they've been in forbearance for three months and we're closing escrow next month. So it's, you're not going to see those REO numbers go so high like they were in 07 and 08. Um, I see what exactly what, what David is saying right here. When you have 90% of the people with equity still in their homes, that's a huge game changer for where we're headed. Um, but we have to educate them on that because yeah. they will sit there in their homes and they will eat up that, that equity without making payments. Then you have a problem. Yeah. It would be fascinating, David, and I know, you know, you know I'm always asking for the slide after the slide that wasn't <laughs> right. created. Uh, I think it would be really fascinating to look at these numbers as a contrast to 2007. Right. And even though we didn't have forbearance then, right. Yeah. But just to be able to say, cause, cause you and I both already know what's going to happen. You're going to see it's more like 59% of the people have 1% or more equity in their home because everybody was buying property with no money down and they were buying multiple properties with no or little to no money down. Mm -hmm. Think yeah. that's something we can get relatively soon. I, I can tell you, we've been after that for, for a while on um, equity and, and the housing crash. It's hard data to come by, but, but I'll tell you what we do have. Um, what we know back then is the uh, amount of homes that were owned free and clear is right around 30% back then. And again, I went back to the John Burns consulting number that, that we've talked about. The other thing that we know about back then, if you remember back to the slide that we used for cash out refinances, yeah. uh, in the significant uh, amount of cash out refis that were happening back then as compared to today, and I would go back to what Yvonne said, which is the point there were lessons that consumers learned in the housing crash that they say, I do not want to repeat that again, and I'm going to handle my business differently this time. However, David, don't you think that there's, um, a, there's a slight chance that over the next six months, 
we might see an increase in that cash out equity. So they're going to take sure. that money out. And so then that, you know, in 12 months from now, we could be sitting here talking about a whole different game. And sure. Tom's making yeah. those relationships again with those REO com companies. I, I think that here's the benefit of that. You've handled equity differently and, and I'll call it the good times. You have that as an option in the challenging times. That's the great thing that homeownership provides that renting doesn't provide. So you're exactly right. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna watch that and let that play out. But that is, that, is a, that is a benefit and a blessing to a lot of families and a lot of homeowners. So I think this is an important conversation, but I know, you know, the other side of this is you know, we're talking supply and demand. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, let's, I think we, let's continue on this path and I know I'm going to be watching and monitoring for questions and comments and feedback from my friends out there. Let me just open yeah. this up, but David, let's get back into the slides. Yeah. Let's, let's talk supply because we've got a really good visual look at supply right now uh, in listings across this country. And that's what, you, you know, what we've been talking about. And, and this compares 2018, 2019 and to this year in 2020. And, you know, I put a red star right there in the, in the middle of the slide that you can see around September of last year, we started to, to decrease in the number of available listings across the country. And, and you can see the orange bar there of what we've seen here so far in this year in decrease. And, and, and you know, really looking at this visually, we are not where we have been in supply in this country, you know, since, you know, gosh, we're, we're well below 2018 and even further below 2019. And so this undersupply keeps, you know, keeps challenging us. We started this year saying, okay, this is going to be the issue. But again, we're, we're, we're talking about this economic issue of what's going to happen to prices. And we got to realize we're in a, in an undersupply situation across the country right now. And this really gives a, a visual to it, but, but there's an even, there's an interesting look as well at year over year change in listings that I want to bring in here because we've talked a lot about listings coming back to market and the great work that everybody's done to bring listings uh, to the market. And you can see here that while we've started to, you know, bring those listings back to market, the total number of listings is decreasing, meaning they're getting, they're getting purchased literally as quickly as they come to market, even quicker than they come to market in this case. Um, and and, and it, so that, that gives us a, a good picture of that listing uh, issue. And Ivy Zellman summed this up really good. And, and yesterday in her broker report, she, she says the severity of inventory tightness should remain a relative benefit to home prices from this upward pressure on home prices. But it's also a risk factor to the degree of rebound in unit sales going forward. So I, while we can say on pricing, we're, we're seeing this upward pressure that we've talked about it's a risk in the, uh, you know, the amount of recovery, the, the, literally the number of homes that we can, uh, that, that we can sell today. David, and let's look at the other impact of this. Let's go back to, and I know I'm, you maybe don't have the slide handy, but uh, how much additional revenue is created for every real estate transaction that impacts the overall recovery of the economy? Yeah. Yeah, the number, I can tell you the number off there, it's $88,000 on average that one transaction, now that's of a new home uh, across the country that impacts the economy. And existing homes, about half of that, think about that in the you know, mid to low 40s of economic impact from the commissions, you know, we're all paid to the, you know, uh, you talk about your brother-in-law and, and the blind company yes. and, you know, somebody going out and buying blinds and how that affects other businesses and suppliers and, you know, you know, and then you go to literally the materials that are needed to construct a new home. And, and yes, our, our ability to make massive impact on the economy through one home sale is, is just about like unlike any other business. So Yvonne, when you, when you see this quote from Ivy Zellman, you know, what, what triggers in your mind as a coach and then, you know, for you in a business with, in two different states, but I'm going to play the role of coach here. What do you see when you see this? What do you think to yourself? here's what I have to tell my clients. Uh, it, it, the inventory issue is, is so interesting to me. When we came out of 2000, the 2008 crash, um, you, there was the big lawsuit with the banks, so they stopped foreclosing. All we had left was short sales. 2011, 2012 were short sale inventory. Coming from Riverside County, California, the number four hit in the nation for foreclosures and red flag. Um, and then literally on a dime, 
because the inventory levels had gone so low that January 2013, I'll never forget, switched to an equity market. And so we started seeing sellers coming back into the market with equity. That is the same, almost the same scenario we're seeing right now. When you see inventory levels less than 30 days, in some cases it's you know two weeks and our normal inventory markets are six months. Um, it's a huge problem, which it, yes, in Zellman's um, statement, it's a benefit to home prices. However, at the same time, it's a problem because we're even starting to see inventory levels of new construction decrease they didn't start building a bunch of new construction because they weren't going to get stuck holding the bag again. So they, everybody thought, oh, there's so much new construction happening right now. It's all over the board. No, it was actually a small percentage of what they were building in 2006 and seven. So they're trying to buy land right now to go build new, new construction. So across the board, I see a future problem inventory wise. Um, and, and that's going to be a problem it rates, are, it's going to be kind of stagnant, I think. Wouldn't you say, David? I mean, wouldn't you see more of a stagnation happening where there's just no movement? It's just going to stop things. So inventory is really a, a key factor. So with my coaching clients, it's all about how are you getting listings right now? What are you saying to people? Where are they moving? Um, what is their reason for moving? And the qualifying uh, need for that. What, what really, because there's always a need to move. It's just, are you getting in front of those people and educating them on why they should do it now? Yeah. So, uh, David, I actually want to ask you a different question. And, and Yvonne, thank you for that answer. Uh, Kevin Emanuel uh, asked this question. He said, so then, so what's driving the undersupply then? Is it given that home prices are so high? Is it because rents are so high? Why aren't we seeing a wave of properties coming on the market? I think there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, and we, we know we've dealt with undersupply since, for, for the large part, since the crash. Um, a lot of that is due just literally to the, the number of uh, units that builders are putting out. You know, we've, we've seen statistics that across the country we're under supply to, to the degree of almost a million units when you look at everything across this country. And, and it, it is a, a fallout of the housing crash where a lot of tradesmen, a lot of builders, you, you know, got into other businesses. Now, I, I heard something very interesting uh, this week that Lennar, the largest home builder, you know, across the U.S. was taking people that had been impacted in this um, in this downturn, primarily from the service business, and was tra was training them uh, in, in in building houses. But I, I think it's it's a it's a it's a it's an issue of of still hangover from 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 the housing decline to to literally a skill issue, and and you're seeing some different decisions being made by by companies in that area. So I want to make a statement, and then we'll we'll jump back into sort of the you know, the slide I'm looking at, which is about inventory as a percentage of households. Um, mm -hmm. But for everyone watching right now, if I was your coach, I would say to you, listen up. You do not talk to enough people every day or worse, you're just talking to the same 30 or 40. You yeah. need to cast a significantly larger net. If you follow me on Instagram and my stories, when people say to me all the time in a Q&A format, Tom, I'm really frustrated by the fact that you know, like I'm 10 years in the business and I still don't have, I don't wake up knowing I've got more business. I think every day is a roll of the dice. And my response was, have you taken the advice that I started giving you a decade ago? You've got to become the most recognizable, trusted name in your marketplace. How do you do that? You create and share content, right? Then you've got to build repeatable and scalable marketing and lead generation. The reason why, when I look at my personal clients, the Andy C's who listed nearly 70 homes in the last two months, or uh, Tim Smith, about the same, Jill Biggs, probably more than that. You know, here's three agents in three different parts of the country that are getting so many listings right now. Why? Because it's the flight to quality, right? The consumer's flight to quality. But the underlying reason why is that their marketing and lead generation is turnkey, that their direct mail, that their phone calls, that their lead sources that they're going after are so tight and they never stopped during the down. So I challenge every one of you, you don't have a competition issue right now to get listings. You have a competition, you versus you, to get to work consistently between now and the end of the year to attract more listings. Don't worry about the Nobody lack of inventory overall. Get focused on yeah. you. Nobody talks to enough people. Um, we know that from the numbers that we do with our coaching clients, you have to talk to have actually have 
200 conversations a month to hit approximately 20 to 30 transactions a year, depending on who you're talking to. Yep. And nobody comes close to that, even though they're high performers. It, yeah. it, if you did it religiously, you're going to do more transactions. You're going to understand what people are needing. You're going to be talking. You'll have your thumb on the pulse of what's going on in your market. And then you get more deals and people will trust you and move. Right now they're not moving because they're, they're like scared. What do I buy? Where do I go? Yep. hundred percent. So David, let's jump back into the slides. Yeah, I'll bring that slide up that you just mentioned real quick. Uh, it kind of piles on this inventory issue. I think we've hit it pretty hard, but you know, uh, Ivy Zellman, Zellman Associates also released this, that inventory as a percentage of households uh, is half of, of the all time low. And so, you know, we know this is, is, a, is a significant issue across the country. And I wanna bring it back to this question that we talked about, okay, what's gonna happen with prices? We use the Moody's quote there and saying, Hey, we, we might see, see some issues coming up. Well, from a supply side, when we go back and we address forbearance, when we address inventory, um, certainly basic economics, we don't see that. And, and I think that's important. Even this week, NAR released that on average, yeah. there are about three offers on a home that closed in May. Uh, from just about two in April 2020 and in May 2019, the prior year. Uh, it, it just over two offers. So as we start to look at that demand, that, that supply is fueling this demand of multiple offer scenario on, on, on a lot of homes across the country. Oh, now, one of my clients down in Temecula, California, they had an open house on the first weekend of the listing. 100 people came through the open house. This is post COVID or now we're during COVID, wherever we're at with COVID, but yeah. 100 people came through and they had 19 offers and it went far over list price. I mean, that is what we were seeing in the, the REO days on REO listings. And that's on an equity seller. I mean, that's, that's housing supply 101. Yes. Yeah. So that you're talking right there, it leads us into that next piece of demand. So we know where we're at in supply, but if we're going to address this issue, we got to talk about demand. Now, now, Tom, I want to go back to what you talked about last week or two weeks ago. Can we start to break down who's been impacted by low unemployment, yes. uh, by, by, by these, these unemployment numbers? Now, the, the interesting thing, I, I want to, everybody that's watched us for the number of weeks that we've done this, we started out with that report from First American, where if you remember, the chief, chief economist said, those that are being affected disproportionately on the lower income earning scale were likely to have not been looking for homes. We, we talked about that and, and we addressed this. Now we have a, a new look at unemployment by age group. And we know here that, that you know, disproportionately younger people have been impacted in unemployment right now. This comes out of the, the most recent unemployment report. And you can see the way to look at this is by age group, the percentage of those individuals that are unemployed. And you can see really, I, I would take the, 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 the two bars to the left below 24 to be the, the most significant uh, you know, impact of unemployment right now. Now, what's interesting there is, is I went back and I looked at the 2019 profile of buyers and sellers that NAR puts out. And the age group under 24 represented 3% of buyers and sellers in 2019. So while this is, this is a topic that I think we need to be extremely sensitive to and, you know, people that are impacted, families that are impacted by unemployment, we them and be sensitive to that that need as best we can but what we can tell in the data is that the predominance of people that are being impacted right now weren't likely to be homeowners or or data wise had transacted to buy a home at that point so david i want to make a statement just really quick here i asked you i asked you for this two weeks ago i am so grateful that you and the team have put this together the thing i want to say to everybody watching right now is Eh, this may not be the slide that you post, yeah, right? Yeah. Because the blue, the two green, like that could be me, that could be you, that could be your aunt, that could be your best friend, right? What I really wanted from this is I wanted to remove the objection in your head, first and foremost. And secondly, when you're sitting down with a seller who says, well, what's going to happen? You now have this. This 
This is something I would bring on my listing presentation, mm -hmm. right? Just in case they said, but we're a little concerned with unemployment. You know, we're still in the research phase. We're talking to you. Bam. That slide is an excellent one to use. David, let's yeah. show them the next one. Yeah, the, the second thing that's driving demand overwhelmingly across the country is low mortgage rates. And we know for the second week now, um, uh, Freddie Mac you know, releases their weekly average at 3.13. We're in a historically low interest rate environment, and, and, and it's represented by this slide, which represents the percentage of income needed for a mortgage payment and how it's dr decreased dramatically as rates have fallen. You know, we, we know historically that that number is just over 21%. And right now, today, we sit at 14.6% of someone's income devoted to a mortgage driven by predominantly by, by low rates. And, and so as we look at supply, we look at demand, we see a lot of reasons why we, we don't see uh, price deterioration. I'll talk about that in a minute, but, but that is really driving uh, the demand right now is, uh, you know, the, 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 the realization of people saying, you know what, rates are so low, we can now afford the home that we've been thinking about for a while. We can now afford, you know, potentially a second home, whatever the case may be, because rates are so, are so low. Yvonne, when you, when you see all of this, tell me, tell me just kind of, you know, share, you know, you're, you're active in the business and you're coaching, you know, you and John, your husband are developing property. What goes through your mind when you see this? Um, opportunity, like everywhere. And to, to David's point about the age, there's so much talk in our industry about millennials and we have to appeal to the millennial on that. In the beginning of my virtual edge, I used a couple of, of uh, slides. The NAR 2019, home buyer average age is 47, home seller average age is 57. So when you're looking at that, we that, that age group is just at, I'm the youngest baby boomer at 1964, 55, 56 years old now. So those are your sellers, okay? But now you have that middle generation right after the boomers that are coming up. It's a very wealthy group of people. There was a lot of money and there's a ton of money out there right now. That's what we're seeing. We see just a lot of money flowing everywhere. Whether And the biggest challenge is, is the systems and processes behind the lending industry right now. They're a mess. The lending industry is a complete mess. Um, I talked to my escrow officer uh, two days ago. We're trying to fund one of our escrows and she had 20, the lender that she was working with that was doing my funding had 20 loan doc sets show up on Monday. She had, escrow officer had nine deals that were supposed to fund yesterday and only four made it because the, the lending industry and the underwriters and everybody are uh, maxed, they're taxed to the, the hilt. Um, they're still working from home. They're not back in offices um, and they're not able to push them through the system, but there's so much demand that's out there and money flowing. So we're seeing this kind of struggle with all of this and, and, it, and it becomes back to the case of the realtor is responsible for communicating that to everyone in the transaction. And if we're not communicating it, there's gonna be some problems and then the consumer out there is gonna say, I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to sit and watch this show with my bag of popcorn. And, and we can't have that. We have to help people keep moving the system because that's how the system stays healthy. You got to keep the flow going through. So that's what we're seeing everywhere in the whole country uh, across the board. Love it. So David, let's, uh, let's switch to the other issues. So we, you know, we've talked about equity. We've talked about uh, the, you know, the jobless situation, mm -hmm. but what everybody's still concerned about again is okay. So if I buy a house, what's going to happen to the price? Yeah, so yeah. I know we've got some very powerful data points here. Let's go to that and get people informed. Yeah, let me share this with you real quick because we have a couple of looks that we can we, we can look here. And, and the first I'll start with is you know projections that we can see uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID. I'm going to suggest that we're in this post-COVID environment, I'm not saying we're behind this, but these are ones that have been made after, uh, you know, with the realization that we're, you know, we're here. At first is Ivy Zellman. You can see where, where she has revised projections from 4.7% appreciation this year down to 3% in the same on the Reuters survey there, down to 3%. 
Um, and, and then you see an uptick in projections next year by Ivy, but you know, relatively flat, a little bit of a decrease uh, in the Reuters survey. So, so we see, you know, while not as much appreciation maybe as, as they thought going into the year, um, still appreciation, not depreciation. I'll go back to this slide as well that we've, you know, we've talked about before um, or where we have this, you know, this list of what are these experts saying? We talk about six different organizations right now that are projecting this year, next year, and some even into you know, 2022. And, and you can see it right here, home price expectation survey saying, hey, we'll see slight depreciation, but the other five are saying, we're going to see positive appreciation. We talked about this last time, Tom, even Freddie Mac is, you know, uptick their appreciation. Three of those uh, saying, hey, it'll be greater than 3%. So a lot of green on that chart looking forward uh, of, of price appreciation. But I, I think we have to put that in perspective, though, because if we, I mean, I've been around long enough to know when appreciation was 13 to 16% in a year. Sure. So mm -hmm. this at 3%, 2.1, even 4.6, those are still not massive appreciation. In, in most cases, it's just a nice, easy movement. You know, yeah, yeah. it's nothing extravagant. So you got to tell these sellers, hey, just because you have no inventory and competition doesn't mean you're going to get, you know, 300,000 more for your house. That's not how the market works. And so we have to, you know, say that as well, that it's not a 16% appreciation annually. Yeah. It's interesting looking at this. And by the way, David, I, I got an email this morning from uh, Ivy Zellman looking to check up. Um, you know, she's been doing this for a long time. And for the people that don't know who Ivy Zellman is, um, what KCM provides you is for you at a very low cost to be super actionable, super informative, branded, killer data to your past clients in, in Sphere. And I, I think I should know your prices, David, but I, let's call it under $50 a month. 25 bucks a month, yeah. Okay, so Ivy Zellman does the same thing, but she sells it for $1,500 a month. And the people that buy it are all of the Wall Streeters, all of the hedge funds, all the private equities, and all of the biggest real estate companies from an executive standpoint. And I got to tell you, when I look at Ivy's data, I looking at all of those, I would bet more closely on Ivy's numbers than probably anybody else. Right, she's she she is talking directly to Wall Street, right? If she's wrong, she loses a lot of business and a lot of credibility. So, for what it's worth, for what it's very worth. highly respected. And I think back to Yvonne's point, very very the word I would use is normalized appreciation yes. going into yes. uh, the next few years. Yes. So let's talk about the other one that I'm getting a ton right now, David. Which is, and I know Yvonne, I'm sure you're hearing this too, especially with my. New York City, Philly, Miami, yeah. Chicago, uh, downtown Dallas, San Francisco. Everybody's like this. Ah, I'm tired of small living, right? I, if you have a listing right now in Hoboken, New Jersey that has no outdoor patio, right? Those, those homeowners are looking to move like crazy. And David, where do they want to go? Yeah, this is this is an issue we've we've been following, and you know, I would say a couple of weeks ago, and even a month ago, we said, okay, we're starting to see that, but are we seeing trends in different areas? And so we've got some good information here, and I'll start out with uh, a quote from Realtor Magazine. It says here, nearly thirty percent of respondents living in a high density urban area say that the pandemic is prompting them to want to move by the end of the year. This is more than double the rate of those living in the rural parts of the country where residents are much more likely to stay put rather than to relocate. So logically, we know this. People are, are, are in you know, densely populated areas, maybe in uh, you know, condos, things like that, that over the last 90 days, uh, that they've reevaluated to say, do we want to, to live uh, in this area? And, and, and we also saw that in, in uh, let me pull this survey up, um, in, in a move.com survey, showing that buyers are opting in viewing. So we're hearing this anecdotally, we're seeing viewings in rural areas, suburban areas, Trump viewings that are, that are in more urban uh, settings. And so, you, you know, that opportunity right now of saying, okay, somebody's living in an area that they've said, hey, we need uh, different things. Either we wanna be in a different location or there are things that have uh, become more important to us in the last couple of months that has made us say, hey, we, we want to do this. And, and even going back to that quote we just read, we want to do this before the end of the year. 
Um, and, and, and is it, you know, is it's not a new trend. I want to bring in a realtor.com quote here that kind of understates that. It says, this migration to the suburbs is not a new trend, but it's become more pronounced. After several months of shelter in place orders, the desire to have more space, the potential for more people to work remotely are the likely factors of contributing to the popularity of the birds, you know, the burbs. It's this idea of like, now we want a backyard. Now we may want uh, one or two office uh, locations, you know, in a home. Um, and, and it brings in some interesting, uh, you know, predictions for where our market's going to go. And I'm interested to, to hear your take on this, Yvonne, but, but Zillow reported this that since the pandemic, buyers are, are altering what they value in a home. And, and they made some, you know, builders are predicting how future homes will change as a result. And, and I want to walk through these real quick. You know, a portion saying as people spend more time at home during the pandemic, they're realizing that, you know, feature of their home are not working, you know, um, and, and maybe they need more space, maybe they need less space, but they're clearly saying, hey, this is good and this is not so good. Um, home builders here predict open concept floor plans may be a thing of the past as people value more walls, doors, and privacy to be able to get on a, you know, a Zoom call to do something like that. And even new construction you know, offers the chance to build what you want. And, and we're seeing more people saying, hey, we want to we build a home over the last month. So a, a lot happening in this area relative, Tom and Yvonne, to uh, you know, what people are saying is important today versus what was important when we started the year. So Yvonne, I, I have all these thoughts, but I've shared this with many of you before, you know, sitting on the earnings call of Zillow and then uh, Redfin back to back, I forget which one was which, but both talked about this massive digital migration of people that were in these suburban areas looking outside. And I guess my coaching to all of you before I turn it to Yvonne is, you know, depending upon where you are in the world, who are the agent partners you have in each of those areas? I have clients, as I mentioned, in New York City that are reaching out or, or Hoboken, New Jersey and saying, I need, I need agents in Montclair. I need, you know, like all these other spots. My friends in Connecticut, the, my goodness, the state of Connecticut has been at a doldrum while the rest of us had a 10 and a half year run. Connecticut's been flat. Well, all of a sudden today, because of the proximity to Manhattan, Connecticut's real estate market is on fire. They are seeing multiple offers for the first time in a long time. The agents that are winning are the ones that are networking with other agents in those markets. If they're in that market, they need to use better seller attraction strategies. You know, it's not coming out to your suburb area and say, you know, hey, the high risers are moving. Who's thinking about selling? You know, but a more intelligent approach. And the ones that are in the high rise, hey, are you living in your ideal home now? or as you've heard me talk about before, right? Really going to the research phase seller strategy of offering a how to sell your home during COVID, right? On a Zoom session where you get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people on there and you talk about the migration patterns and you talk about where the buyers are coming from and what the options are. Just a little reminder. Yvonne, what goes through your yeah. mind when you see this? Uh, all kinds of things, just like yours. Um, our client, Adam and Coney, Prosper Realty up in Sonoma County, Santa Rosa area. Uh, he hasn't seen so many people leaving San Francisco, San Jose to go into Sonoma County. So they're not all just leaving California. They're stay staying within California, but they're just going, you know, an hour away, 40 minutes outside of town. Um, Tyler Whitman over in New York City, downtown Manhattan, is expanding out into the Hamptons because a lot of the people are looking to get out, you know. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic that we're seeing. One of the sites that I like to recommend, and I'll just uh, do a screen share here. Can I screen share here real quick? Um, is um, How Money Walks. It's the IRS tax migration site, and it's a super cool site. So if you are in, say, Southern California, and you are in the county of Riverside, you'll know that, the, that um, Los Angeles, Orange, San Diego, San Bernardino, and Santa Clara gained wealth from Riverside County, Whereas uh, Maricopa County, Clark County, Mojave County, uh, Yavapai County, and Ada County, Idaho. So Arizona, Nevada, Idaho is getting all of our people out of Riverside County. And the people moving into Riverside County are leaving the cities. LA, Orange County, San Diego, 
San Bernardino. So it's a really cool site to use in that way. And, um, and you can do it for across the country. And then you talk about networking. That's when you start networking with those agents across those markets. Who's moving in, who's moving out, and how are they doing it? And make relationships. And then communicate it to the consumers. You know, where are you going? And how can I help you get there? Um, so many opportunities, like I said, there's just, it's, it's, a, it's a plethora of opportunities if you're looking for them. If you think that there isn't and you're, you're, um, you're stuck, uh, and you didn't pivot when we all did in March, um, then you, you're, you need to do it now. <laughs> Make it fast because there is just so much happening out there and, and people do want to do something. I keep reiterating that, but it's so critical that, that as, as realtors, we understand that and we are here to help them do it. And KCM, uh, Keeping Current Matters has been, I've been with them since, they, since I first heard about them years ago. Uh, I mentioned them many, many times during my Virtual Edge event because it is $25 a month. It's what the least expensive, most important data you can ever get to use for your own marketing. And um, I appreciate everything that David and the team and Steve do over there. And so you guys are crazy not to use that when you're going for these kinds of things. So yes, people are leaving um, cities, they're going to rural. We see it here in Idaho. There's a reason I'm, I'm from California. I'm up here in North Idaho. Um, I'm working with somebody on Sunday who's coming out of Orange County and looking for five acres and wants to bring their eight and the 10 year old and get them out of the city. So. I, I love life. how you say Orange County where I live, the city. <laughs> hey, it's, I never thought of it the city either, but I guess people think of it as the city now. <laughs> wow, all about perspective. Wow. All of a sudden, I live in the big city. I thought I lived at the beach. Okay. Well, if you come to Sandpoint, there's only 8,000 people here, so that could be that why. Is, <laughs> yeah, I think there's 8,000 people in my community. So, exactly. so, so David, being mindful of time, um, mm. we want to talk about market updates and mm. and we also want to talk presidential election. So let's do market, then let's do election, and then let's get everybody off, uh, off to the races with their Friday, hopefully selling even more houses. Absolutely. So let's, let's talk about, about market. I'll bring a couple slides in here because they're, they're very interesting relative to what's happening in the overall market and what's, our, uh, you know, what's happening in our market. So as we look at what you know, is happening in the housing market, we've talked about a lot today. I brought this quote here from NAR Research. It says, as more Americans get back to work and it's across the country, we're starting to see both buyers and sellers returning to the market, creating the beginnings of what we believe is a V-shaped recovery in the housing sector. So we talked a lot about that. Remember, we started this out talking about a V-shaped recovery and oh, yeah. you know, certainly in our business, we're starting to see that. We want to take a, a zoom out look to, I brought another quote in from the Wall Street Journal to say, okay, overall economy, what, what is happening there? And, and this comes you know, from Greg here at the Wall Street Journal says that first stage of recovery looks V-shaped. After bottoming out in April, economic activity has continued to rise into early June, according to a range of private data. An L-shaped recovery, this is the important part, in which activity stays depressed now looks remote, and we're thankful for that. And while overall recovery may not end up in a V, it's less feasible than many had feared. And so what we're seeing in the overall economy is this, you know, we talked last time uh, about the Wall Street Journal survey of economists, uh, I, I believe, where uh, the overwhelming majority, nine out of 10 said, you know, we're gonna see some form of V where it's a Nike swoosh, is it a straight V? as is the pause button is unpressed across the economy and, and things start to happen. Now, the interesting thing is I brought into uh, the showing time graph that we've looked at week after week as we've gone through this. And we can certainly see the, the V recovery as we dropped off and bottomed out uh, around the early part of, uh, of April there. But you start to see that arrow start to, to flatten out. And I would offer that over the last couple of months, and Tom, you know, you said this and what we were doing, we brought the data and said, listen, when, when, when we start to turn the corner on this, that business is going to be there. And we've had the benefit of the last couple of months of this pent up demand where people are saying, hey, let's get back out into the market and let's, let's go out and let's, you know, buy a home, sell a home, do whatever we're doing. In this case, the showings, whether they be virtual or in person, and, and, and so we're starting to watch that to say, okay, what's going to happen as we, as we continue to go on? But 
But suffice it to say, as we look at the last couple of months and we see the activity, um, we've benefited from this pent up demand, just like we, we talked about uh, of you know, folks coming back into the market uh, once, once they were able to. So David, I know we're gonna talk about the election. I wanna start by yeah. making a comment to everybody. Actually, I really, I want to just kind of hear all of our comments and I would love some feedback. By the way, Yvonne, that was a huge share. I had a whole bunch of people like, oh my God, how money walks. I'm definitely, you know, I had to like <laughs> repost it like a couple of times saying, they're like, what was that site again? Oh my goodness. I put you it know. on there too. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, remember we used to have to go to census.gov to try which and is figure hard to out. Read. And I mean, which is like the equivalent of going to the DMV for a good time. Right. So, <laughs> you know, the fact that they've done this is fantastic. So the presidential election, let me just give you my two cents, my friends. Uh, I wrote down in my following, uh, my personal income has always been in direct correlation to the value that I deliver to the market. My income has always been in direct correlation to the value that I deliver to the market. So the more people that I help, right, the more opportunities I have for abundance. That's how it works. And I think back to my professional career and I go, hmm, I made money with Bush, I made money with Clinton, I made money with Bush, I made money with Obama, I made money with Trump, and whether it's Trump or Biden, look up here. I don't care, because I will continue to pivot and adjust and look for ways to serve and to make a difference. Now, think about what I just said. I'm gonna to continue to look for ways to serve and to make a difference, and I'm not going to allow 700 people in DC to determine how my life is. Does that make sense? So let me just give you a little insight, ready? I hallucinate, this is just my hallucination that 20 to 30% of the people on the right and 20 to 30% of the people on the left are slightly crazy. And all the rest of us in the middle, right? We just wanna love on our families, do our jobs and move forward powerfully. If I was talking to my friends in Israel, they might even say it's even smaller. They might say it's like 1%, 1%, right? Here's my point. My most important advice to you is two things. One, you better plan to work your butt off between now and October 15th, because we already know fourth quarter sales drop. We already know transactions drop between eight and 19%, right, in the fourth quarter. But in what will arguably be the most tumultuous presidential election cycle we have ever seen, I think it could get a little bit worse. So I'm telling all my personal clients, hey, June is the new March, April. So that means July and August, when you used to take a break and go on vacation and go screw around, guess what? Now you are working your face off and you're going to do it all the way up until October 15th. And then you're going to take your family and go celebrate and bail. That's my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice to you is since you already know who you're going to vote for, stop watching the news. It doesn't make you feel good. It pisses you off. I know some of you that watch both sides just to really get yourself angry and drink a little more at night. In a loving, loving way, I would tell you, you already know who you're gonna vote for. Instead of doing that, read something, learn something, love on your family, go for a walk, get some rest, but no more news between now and the election. Just, just pass on that stuff. That's my advice. Yvonne, what do you got for us? I always call the news days of our lives. It, it, you know, it's like you could leave it for three years and you come back and it's like the same people are getting the same people pregnant and they're getting the same people dying and they die 18 times. And it's like, you just don't need it. You know, stay away from it. I did that with my clients um, this last week. I actually sent out a message to all of the people that I coach and said, hey, you guys, um, they're killing it anyway. And they're just doing a great job. And but I said, hey, refresh your social media policies amongst your team. Um, you know, I worked for Remax for 24 years. We had a social media policy, believe it or not, even when it wasn't a big deal. And, um, and we have a social media policy with Tom Ferry as coaches. And I believe that everybody should have a social media policy. And whatever that is for your brand. I mean, if your brand is, this is what you do, then great. But, um, but I'm also one that I, my friends know I'm very opinionated when we're in private conversations. Um, otherwise, I have no opinion. And um, I sell real estate for a living. I work with everyone because people don't care when they're buying or selling 
what your personal choice or opinions are. They want you to help them buy or sell a house. They want you to know your business. It's just like if you go to a doctor, do you care what side of the aisle he sits on? If he's the best brain surgeon or heart surgeon that you can have? No, I want him to save me, okay? So I just stay neutral and, and I think that's how everybody should be and I ignore it and, and you work your face off. Um, I'm like Tom, you know, being this, I, we always made ourselves recession proof. We said, you make yourself recession proof by working constantly. And it's, it's nose down, ass and elbows up. And you stay in the trenches and you do the work. And when you do that, there is no market problem. Um, you work through it because you're in the position like we were when Tom got us all of those REO connections, the short sale connections when that was yeah. big. We were, we were working at the moment it came in front of us and we were ready for it. And so if you're not ready for it, then it's uh, the opportunities are going to pass you by. Love it. David, no close it out, my friend. I think this is, this is the question. Here's what I would say directly to this issue right now. And it's already, I would offer, it's already happening. And I'll guarantee you this is going to continue to happen and gain steam. Tom, you made the analogy of both sides. Both sides will use information in the market to make their case. And you're gonna see half the people say, hey, hey, unemployment's way worse than what you think. The other half's gonna go, it's way better than what you think. And our job today with the information is to cut through and say, this is the truth. Let's give people the truth Let's trust their intelligence. Now, now, here's the interesting thing. We sit right here at the end of June. We started this about 90 days ago, Tom. And what we say, let's build a 90 day, you, you got to have a 90 day commitment with 30 day plans. And we'll figure out the next 90 days when we get there. Well, guess what? We're here. We're ready to enter into the next 90 days. Tom, you just gave that window of now is the time. Yep. The time is to educate. The time is to bring the truth and, and give people that truth. Trust their intelligence as we go forward. 100%. So for all my friends out there, um, first of all, I want to say, Yvonne, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as always, super, super great to see you and then to hear your perspective and point of view. Uh, David, you and the team at, uh, you know, at KCM, just, you know, when I look at, I look at what you guys and gals uh, what you provide us. It is just nothing shy of extraordinary. So for all my friends, you see there's a probably a link down there. Maybe we pinned it. If you go to mykcm.com forward slash Tom Ferry, as always, that's where the slides are. Uh, so I would just say to you all in closing, listen, I wish you all a terrific finish to June, an insanely great and busy July and August and September and October. We'll be back in two weeks. We'll have at that point all the new unemployment numbers and a whole lot more to share with you. Do me a favor, if this made sense, if this helped you, share it with an agent or two, you know, maybe tag a friend or two that needs to see this information. Maybe someone that you care about who has maybe just gone into that dark place in their head and just say, hey, go right to 38 minutes and just listen to that, right? Whatever that message was that you knew would make a difference, right? I said to you guys a couple of weeks ago, 45% of the real estate agents took an unpaid vacation for about 12 weeks. They furloughed themselves. We need to get them all back. We need to get them all back, even if just for the one or two listings that they can bring to the market that your buyer can buy. We need to get them back. So let's help those fellow agents. Let's get them back into the right mindset. So have a great finish of the week for all my friends in the US. A wonderful 4th of July coming up right around the corner. Keep working your butts off and we'll see you all soon. Take care. <laughs>